It says, I am what it says I am. But only in the passages where it says positive things about me. I have what it says I have. Meaning health and wealth in Jesus. I can do what it says I can do. Meaning I can preach hard enough to bully Jesus into giving me what I ask for. He's manipulating people with his emotions. This is not a Christ-centered ministry. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.17, just a couple passages earlier, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. If we feel our cleverness of speech is necessary to convince people of the cross, we're making the power of the cross void. And now it's time to beat on myself. It reminds me of one of my first sermons that I did. And I have found that young preachers have a tendency to get up behind the pulpit and say absolutely everything that they know. They give all of their knowledge because they don't know if they're going to be asked back again. <laughs> and because they don't want to just last five minutes. And because they want everybody in the congregation to know how smart they are. I was asked to give a sermon, and when I was thinking about the text that I would give, I had recently watched a video about David and Goliath, and it was a neat video that gave a lot of historical information and a lot of really detailed things that you don't notice in the story, like the tactics that the slingers would have used to take down these large swordsmen such as Goliath, and even weird nerdy details that I get into, like they mentioned the types of rocks that are in the valley. And I tell you now, there's no reason behind the pulpit I needed to mention the type of rock that was in the valley. But I had been so focused on appealing to the audience's reasoning and in making myself look smart that I didn't make any point. I got up there and I talked for 30 minutes about how neat the story of David and Goliath is, and I never mentioned Christ once. And in that sermon, I demonstrated that that day, at the very least, I was leading a me-centered ministry. The center of our message isn't the mind, and it isn't the heart. It's the cross. The cross. If we center it upon anything else, then we aren't ministering properly. Romans 12, 2, very famous passage. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We are commanded to go out into the world and to preach the gospel. But in doing so, do not be conformed to this world. Do not bow to that temptation that tells us that we are the convincing ones. That their conversion is in our hands. They need to hear the cross. They don't need to hear you. They need to hear the cross. This world has enough motivational speakers to last until the end of time. It's the message that they don't want to hear, but they need to hear it. The cross of Christ. And you might say, this is easier said than done. You told me last time, boast in the Lord. And I can tell you honestly that in that month I have not proclaimed the gospel. And this is me speaking now, this is not you. I can say honestly and sadly that in that month since I told you to boast in the Lord, I did not share the gospel with one single lost person unless they were in a congregation or a good news club. It's easier said than done to say preach a cross-centered ministry. But I want to encourage you with this next point. Point one, preaching the cross. Point two, the power which is from the Spirit. The power which is from the Spirit. Verse four, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul says that when he preaches the gospel, it's not from his own power, but he's preaching from the power of the Holy Spirit within him. It is the Spirit and the Spirit alone that empowers Paul to proclaim the gospel. It appears from the text that Paul is prone to nervousness and fear and trembling, but praise God that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God that Paul has been redeemed and has the Spirit of God living within him, empowering him, empowering him to preach boldly the cross, making him strong when he is weak. 
I'm going to get on a soapbox here, but I really think of these three points, and I'll go ahead and spoil the third point, the glory of God, and I told you earlier, the preaching of the cross and the glory of God, as good Baptists, we would affirm completely both of these points. The cross is the center of our ministries, and all of the glory goes to God. But I really feel that on this point, that we are empowered by the Spirit. We're giving lip service to that statement and not demonstrating it in our lives. Why do we do such an injustice in worshiping and glorifying the Spirit in the way that we should if we truly believe that He is God? I mentioned it a few weeks ago. I'll mention the statistic again. 59%. 59% of professing Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is not a person, but a force. 59%. With another 17% saying, I'm not really sure. How ashamed should we be that 24% of professing Christians would affirm that the Holy Spirit is a person? 24%. That is sad. A study of the 500 most popular Christian songs written in the last 10 years. And you might say, well, I don't listen to modern Christian music. And that may be true, but odds are you raised the generation that is listening to this music. And a study showed that only 10% of modern Christian worship songs mention the Holy Spirit. One in 10 worship songs mention the Holy Spirit. And only 1% are written primarily about the work of the Spirit. We have failed. We are failing to worship our God fully if we keep pushing the Holy Spirit to the side. And maybe you are one of those Christians who affirms that the Holy Spirit is a person and that's great. And maybe you don't listen to that modern Christian music anyway, so you're not having those influences. But I see it in your kids and in your grandkids. We come from a generation that doesn't talk enough about the power of the Holy Spirit and doesn't teach the doctrine of the Trinity in the way that we should, and it's spreading to the next generations. You ask the kids in children's church, and they don't know any better because they're kids, but we can teach them better. You ask the kids in children's church, who do you love the most? And you hear that sweet answer that you're hoping to hear, well, Jesus and God. And that's great for a moment until we realize the Trinitarian heresy that we are teaching to our kids, that Jesus who, by the way, is God, needs to be mentioned separate from God, and the Holy Spirit doesn't warrant a mention at all. Shame on us. We've gone far too long ignoring a member of the Godhead. Shame on us. Where would we be without the Holy Spirit? Where would we be? I'm going to list some scripture, and I'm going to try and do so at a pace that you can note all these down because I don't have time to read each of them. Ephesians 1.17, the Spirit helps us to understand God. Romans 6.10, the Spirit is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 8.10, the Spirit is the one who gives us eternal life. John 14.26, the Spirit is the one who reminds us of the teachings of Jesus. Romans 8.26, the Spirit intercedes for us when we are weak. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, the Spirit is the source of our spiritual gifts. Galatians 5, and you should just read the whole chapter. It teaches us that the Spirit is the one who empowers us to be sanctified. Acts 1, 8, the Spirit empowers us to witness to others. I'm going to read this last one because I think it's important. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. It says this, in him, you also, have, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. And the picture that Paul is using here is of a signet ring that a leader would wear on their finger and they would dip it into the wax and when they're sending an important message they would place it upon the letter to show that it belongs to them. It is the Holy Spirit himself 
who is the mark of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is the mark of a true Christian. So why in the world are we treating him as lesser than Christ and the Father? This is a grave sin. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Therefore I make known to you that no one is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And here's what I want you to notice. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It is impossible for us to truly proclaim that Jesus is Lord without the Spirit within us. Without the Spirit, Paul cannot preach. You cannot preach, and it's that simple. And it's time we give him the glory and the honor that he deserves. Lastly, the purpose. So the preaching is Christ-centered, and the power is from the Spirit, and the purpose is to glorify God. Verse 5. So he's listed all of these things. He didn't come in superiority of speech or of wisdom, but he preaches Christ crucified, and he's empowered by the Spirit. Why? Verse 5. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. We are not ministering properly if our ministry is not centered on the, cro the cross, and we're not ministering properly if our ministry is not empowered by the Spirit, and we're not ministering properly if the glory is for ourselves and not for God. Why does Paul preach the cross? Why should we preach the cross? And why does Paul rely on the Spirit's power and not his own? Because when he does these things, it gives God all of the glory and all of the honor. We cannot control how people will receive our message. And when you go out and boast in the Lord, there will be countless people who receive your message with mockery, with revile. This doesn't change the fact that we're commanded to share to them, but it's the reality of the situation. The gospel offends. We can't control how people receive our message, but we can control the way that we preach that message. And the easiest way to guarantee that God receives all of the glory from our sharing his word is to preach a cross-centered message and rely on the Spirit's power. And, God or, and Paul says that if we do these things, your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. God's glory should be our ultimate goal. Psalm 115, 1. This is David. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. I want you to know that sharing the gospel, boasting in the Lord, as we have been commanded to do, it's a hard road. And you will lose friends. And there will be schisms between family members. But preaching the gospel truly, and truly centering that gospel message on the cross, and truly affirming that the power to preach that gospel comes from the Spirit, is one of the greatest ways to bring glory to God. The Bible teaches us clearly that there will be a day, a glorious day, where every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. There will be a day where every nation, even those nations that we look out right now and we know that they are not affirming that God is their Lord, but God is the King of all the nations. And there will come a day when every soul recognizes this. We can be empowered by the Spirit and used as instruments toward that goal. And how beautiful of a gift that is. The greatest plan of redemption that has ever been known. That God would take a race of wretched and awful men who sin against him daily and bring them out from that muck and mire by the power of his son's precious blood. The most powerful act of redemption that has ever been known, and we are given the beautiful promise that, empowered by the Spirit, we can share that message with other people. We can have a hand 
in God's redemptive story and how beautiful that is. 1 Peter 4.11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If we truly affirm that the cross is the center of our lives and of our message. And if we truly affirm that the Spirit is God who has the power to empower you to do great things in His name and who lives within you and tells you clearly He will never leave you or forsake you, if we truly affirm these things, then we should see sharing the gospel not as a burden, but as a beautiful task in serving our King. When we go out and we proclaim these beautiful truths, we glorify God, period. If we truly affirm that all of the glory and honor and dominion and power belongs to our great God, then why are we neglecting this task that we have been told clearly glorifies him? So I leave you with the same call to action that I left with you last time. And I pray this upon you, and I pray this upon me, knowing that I didn't even obey my own call to action last time, but I pray, knowing that the Spirit empowers us to do this, boast in the Lord. Preach Christ crucified. If we care about giving God glory with our lives, then we need to stop ignoring one of the greatest ways to do so, to preach the gospel to a lost and dying world. Are we truly giving God all of the praise and the honor and glory that we possibly can if we aren't even telling the people who are around us? And I want to encourage you again, church, you can do this. Because it's not by your power, but the Spirit's power that we are given this task. You can do this. The Spirit has promised us that he will empower us. If our true desire is really, is truly to glorify God as we say that it is, the call to action is simple. Preach the cross knowing that you are empowered by the Spirit so that you, each of you, can glorify God with your lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for that beautiful gospel message, God, that tells us clearly of the love and care that your Son has for each and every one of us. That you love us so deeply, God, that you gave your only Son that all we have to do is believe in him and we are saved from that perishing death that we are told is promised to us because of our sin. Lord, we thank you for that redemption, for that salvation that you have given us, God. I pray that you would empower us to go out from this place and to tell other people what you have done in our lives, God. You empower us to share this message, and I pray that we would rely on that power as we go from this place. And God, we affirm that you deserve all of the honor and glory and dominion that we can possibly give from our lives, God. And I pray that you would encourage us, that you would embolden us to stop ignoring this task that you have given us and to go and to be faithful to your command, God. Lord, I'm burdened knowing that in other places around the world there is war and there's pestilence and there's famine. God, and people are dying not knowing you as their Savior, God. I pray 
that you would empower us to share your world to to share your word to a world that desperately desperately needs the gospel we love you we thank you for the cross and for the empty tomb that is our reason for rejoicing we pray all of this in your son's precious name